Josh Shedd, uh, my name is Mike Ray. I'm a senior product engineer here with uh, Sika and wanted to talk to you today for a little while about glass preparation for auto glass replacement applications. So just to Me, I am, uh, I'm going to be the speaker. I'm going to be giving the presentation. Um, the host that you just heard is Josh. He's, uh, he's our market field manager um, in support of our transportation aftermarket business. And our panelist, uh, the one who will be answering the questions, is Ron Combs. Uh, he's our uh, national accounts manager uh, from our sales group. So uh, please feel free to get those questions in uh, through the Q&A. And uh, Ron will either answer them on the spot uh, if he can through the, uh, through the chat function, through the Q&A function. Or anything that seems um, you know seems seems important, or maybe he he can't answer. He'll direct them to me uh, at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to get those questions in. So uh, before we get into the um, to the to the heart of the matter, uh, just wanted to, in case anybody's not familiar with Sika, wanted to give you a little bit of a background in, in, as far as who we are and what we do. Um, Sika, we're a specialty chemicals company. Um, Really, what we do here at Sika, um, bonding, sealing, damping, reinforcing, protecting. Um, we're very big in, in the building sector, uh, very big in, in construction industry. Um, we're also big in transportation. We have a big automotive presence. And really, our products are, like I said, designed to, um, to, to cover those functional areas in all the, uh, all the different markets that, uh, that, that we service. Uh, oh, uh, globally, we've got 20, uh, over 25,000 employees in, in over 100 countries, uh, over 200 uh, production plants um, across the spread across the globe. Uh, just last year, we were able to open seven new plants. Uh, we obtained uh, 93 new patents in uh, 2019, um, and uh, as of last year, uh, almost eight and a half billion dollars in, in net sales uh, across the globe. So just a little bit more in terms of uh, the specific um, target markets that we cover. Um, concrete, uh, waterproofing, roofing, flooring and coating, ceiling and bonding, refurbishment. You'll notice that all of those are building envelope um, application areas. Um, we do a lot of business in, in all those different areas. And then the last area where I work and where we're gonna be living today is that industry designation. And that's really a catch-all for, for SECA. Um, we do everything from transportation, uh, bus, truck, rail, marine, uh, appliances and manufacturing, um, facades and fenestration, um, automotive aftermarket, and then we've got our uh, automotive business as well. But like I said, we're going to be living here in the, uh, the industry market for us here today. So if we dig a little bit deeper into industry, uh, you'll see a lot of the things that I had just mentioned, uh, appliances and manufacturing, uh, industrial lamination, transportation, automotive. Uh, marine tooling and composites, which is a, a, a new area for us that, uh, that that we're currently growing and very excited excited about. Uh, renewable energies, and then uh, specifically where we're going to be talking the automotive aftermarket. So I'm guessing probably most of you that are on this webinar are somewhat familiar with Sika in the automotive aftermarket. But just in case anybody's new to Sika or would like to learn a little bit more about what we do in the automotive aftermarket. Um, we are OEM trusted and approved. We uh, we are OEM for glass bonding in um, in several different plants across North America, uh, including uh, plants with Ford and, and Honda and uh, and Chrysler and um, uh, several others that are escaping my mind at the at the, at the moment. But uh, we we are um, OEM trusted and approved. Um, we crash test every product that we release. Uh, over seventy crash tests performed worldwide. Uh, since we entered the market in, in the late 80s. Uh, I personally have been involved with somewhere around 17 or 18 of those crashes here in the U.S. So um, anything that comes to market, um, rest assured that um, it has been tested, tested again, and uh, finally crash tested to validate all the testing that we did in the lab. Um, we really believe strongly in um, sales support and, and having a presence out in the field. So. We've got a sales staff that uh, crosses the nation uh, to make sure that uh, at a moment's notice, if you need if you need to talk to a SICA person, uh, you can get somebody in your area uh, on the phone. Uh, if you need training to get to get certified, um, our our sales staff is always there and available uh, to complete the training, um, and and really just um, you know or bring donuts and bagels uh, is what I typically see most often from those guys. But uh, they also do some training, so I'm told. 
Um, but uh, yeah, those guys, uh, you know, are out there uh, every every single day uh, trying to provide the best support uh, possible for for our customers. And we thrive on innovation. Um, you know, I've been in this role supporting our aftermarket business now for uh, five or six years, um, uh, supporting our other functional areas uh, for the 15 years before that. Um, and in the past five years, I can tell you that there's not a day that has gone by that I'm not working on one development project or another. We're always trying to innovate, um, trying to uh, bring the best state-of-the-art products to our customers. So if we look at uh, the brands that we offer, um, the newest one on there is actually that top one, our Seek Attack Elite Power Cure. There is a whole uh, seminar, a webinar uh, available. If anybody is interested in that, that's actually a boosted polyurethane system that um, will actually provide a cure to OEM level. So think full cure in one hour. Um, so really excited about that. And um, you know, should, uh, should that be something you're interested in, definitely feel free to reach out to, um, to your local SICA sales representative. Uh, to learn more about uh, that exciting new product that we uh, that we launched earlier this year. So um, that's it as far as introduction goes, and now we move on to the main body of the presentation. Um, as I said today, we're going to be talking about glass preparation specifically for AGR. So the main topics that I really want to cover today, um, we'll start off with the glass manufacturing process and how this can lead to contamination that must be remedied uh, at the customer level. Um, and maybe some of the sources of those uh, those contam potential contaminations. Um, and then we'll move on to contamination detection and removal. And then uh, onto the uh, real, really the more CICA specific parts of the, the presentation are pretreatment products that we offer and um, our recommendations for special sets and, and special circumstances. So, Start here with the glass manufacturing process, and there's a very specific reason we wanted to start with this slide and with this topic in, in particular. Um, during the glass manufacturing process, there are so many variables that go into it um, that can lead to all different kinds of uh, properties uh, for a piece of glass, um, for a ceramic frit, um, whatever we may be bonding to, uh, in the, you know, when, when bonding glass into a vehicle, um, there are any number of variables that can contribute to a wide variety of, uh, uh, of adhesion issues. So we wanted to start with this slide to just talk through some of the, uh, some of these potential sources for uh, contamination, some of these variables, um, and just to let you know that it is extremely important to us that we understand this process as, as fully as, as, as we can so that when we go through the development process, when we're developing a new product, uh, a new pretreatment product for application on glass or a new primerless to glass product uh, or a new contamination removal product, when we go through that development process, um, we want to make sure we're taking into consideration all of these different variables and put a product in our customer's hands that is going to account for all these, all these different variables. So that's why it was really important to us to to, to include this slide and, and talk through a couple different topics about the glass manufacturing process, uh, sources for contamination, um, and, and just to give a better understanding of, um, you know, of, of where the difficulties uh, may come in. So we're actually going to start uh, even before um, step number one here. Uh, step number one assumes you've already got uh, a piece of float glass that, you, that you're cutting to size, but I actually wanted to start with the, the floating process itself. Um, for anybody that's not familiar, all glass starts out as, as float glass, and the reason that it's called float glass is that the glass is actually riding along on a bed of molten tin. So you've got um, one side of the glass that's actually in contact with that bed of molten tin, and then you've got the other side of the glass that's actually exposed to the air. And come, it, what we found is that those two different sides, the tin side and the uh, air side, if you will, or atmospheric side or non-tin, whatever, however you prefer to uh, refer to it, they actually have very, very different properties. And um, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later, but um, you know, especially when it comes to adhesion and achieving a good, uh, a good bond to a piece of glass, um, the tin side versus the air side uh, are actually quite different. So we've got our piece of float glass, uh, you see steps one, two, and three there in those nice pictures. Uh, really, that's just um, you know examples and uh, uh, pictures of, of of the glass being cut to the right size. 
Um, not really much to go into there, uh, just, just glass cutting processes, processes there. Moving on to steps four and five here, um, now we start to, um, you know, now some more variability enters the process. So steps four and five, we're talking about applying ceramic frit, which uh, gets applied as a slurry, uh, and then gets baked into uh, a, a solid ceramic uh, in, in, the, in the bake process. So when we talk about ceramic frits, uh, they're just like, um, just like uh, adhesives or anything else, any other product that exists in this world, there are any number of, of different frit formulations. And some of them are specific to laminated parts, some of them are specific to tempered parts, uh, some of them may be suitable for both, um, but there are any number of frit formulations, uh, and they all behave a little bit differently. Um, and and it may be a little bit different. Um, uh, a lot of times, different uh, things may be required in order to achieve a, a good durable bond onto that ceramic frit, based solely on the formulation. But there's another step in the in the fritting process as well, and that's the bake. So you could take the same frit formulation. And if you were to bake it at a different temperature or for a different time, it could give radically different adhesion results uh, when you go to test uh, test adhesion with um, you know with a polyurethane on it. So um, all these all these things really play a huge role in determining the final properties of that ceramic frit. So moving on to uh, steps six and seven, there now you've got a piece of uh, now you've got a piece of fritted glass. Well, now as we all know. That's going to get laminated to a second piece of glass with a uh, typically PVB uh, laminate layer in between. So here we encounter another uh, another area that will allow for some variability uh, when it comes to achieving good adhesion because um, you know that most typically the frit the, the the piece of glass that's fritted is the one that uh, is put on the outside so that more often than not we're bonding to that ceramic frit but um, sometimes we encounter um, pieces of glass that are laminated with that uh, that frit on the inside, what we would call the uh, um, what we would call the side three uh, frit, uh, the side three of the the piece of laminated glass. And what that typically means is that now instead of bonding to ceramic frit, we're actually bonding to the glass itself. And if you remember back to when I had mentioned that uh, the tin side of the flow glass and the air side of the flow glass have uh, very different properties. Well, it turns out that the air side is much easier to bond to than the tin side is. So seeing as how the glass manufacturers themselves get the, get the first uh, uh, choice in which side they want to bond to during the lamination process, well, they're typically choosing the air side uh, to laminate to. So in a inner layer frit part where that, uh, that frit is on the inside and, and not exposed, um, Typically, that means the tin side of the float glass is what's ex is what is exposed and what we are now bonding to, um, which is just um, typically much more difficult than than bonding to the air side, uh, and can lead to some uh, you know to, to to some 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 challenges uh, for adhesive manufacturers in making sure that you know our our system is going to be robust enough to be able to handle that. So finally, um, step eight uh, is the last one that's listed on the uh, on the slide here. Um, fusing the laminate uh, under vacuum and heat. This is another potential source for, for, for uh, well, this would be a potential source for contamination uh, more than anything. A lot of times, um, if you've got uh, vacuum tube lamination taking place, um, they're going to use uh, silicone oil to make sure that, uh, that the, those rubber tubes um, do not stick to uh, the piece of glass that they're trying to, that they're trying to laminate. Uh, and that can, that can lead to silicone oil contamination um, and, and, uh, and other uh, similar sorts of laminate, uh, similar sorts of contamination. And lastly, if we were to extrapolate out to step nine, um, not listed here, but uh, shipping of the parts. You know, a lot of times, um, a lot of times they'll, 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 uh, during the shipping process, especially if something's coming in from overseas, uh, it'll be, be sprayed with, um, you know, a, a fungicide or, you know, some sort of an antimicrobial to, uh, you know, to help prevent, uh, you know, mildew growth and things like that. Um, so really any number of uh, strange foreign contaminants can be uh, introduced to the bonding surface uh, of a piece of glass, you know, even after the manufacturing is done and we move into the shipping, uh, the shipping of those parts. So um, that's my deep dive into the glass manufacturing process and 
Uh, now we'll move on to uh, the next section of the of the presentation, which is actually um, it's talking about contamination. How do we detect it, and how do we how do we remove it? So at Sika, we like to, and I think throughout the industry, we like to uh, we like to classify contamination two different ways. Um, most of the things that you're going to encounter on a day to day basis, we would consider traditional contamination. So it, we're we're talking about dirt and dust and and oils from your fingers uh, and things like that. These are typically very easily removed with just just uh, application of glass cleaner. Um, and, and with Sika, we don't have any uh, strict um, requirements when it comes to comes to glass cleaner. Uh, our customers are free to use really whatever they prefer, um, as long as it doesn't contain an anti-static ingredient. Those um, leave uh, you know leave a, a layer of um, molecules on the surface which uh, really don't like anything to stick to them, uh, which would include uh, Adhesive, so um, we want to avoid anti-static ingredients, um, and typically those are it's very well labeled on the can or on the on the on the data sheet or a cut sheet um, to let you know that that's what the glass cleaner is doing. Uh, and as long as you don't see those things, we're 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 good with just about everything that's out there. Uh, and then once we're uh, in, is in the if all we're removing is non is traditional contamination, uh, once we clean with glass cleaner, we're typically good to uh, to move on to the pretreatment step. Um, so the other classification of, of contamination would be non-traditional contamination. And over the years, um, you know, over the 20 years that I've been involved with uh, auto glass replacement, you know, we've really seen the occurrence of non-traditional contamination just go up and up and up and up and up uh, as more and more parts come from, from overseas. They come in more he heavily contaminated as manufacturers look for ways, as glass manufacturers look for ways to um, pull cost out of their processes. Um, we see more and more things uh, introduced. So, you know, a, a couple of, I, I just wanted to give a couple of typical um, non-traditional contaminants that we, we come across on a, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, first one being mold release agents. So if we've got encapsulated parts, you know, where that trim is actually bonded to the part, um, they don't want, you know, when that, that encapsulation is, is molded to the part, they want to make sure that, um, that uh, when they release that mold, um, that the uh, that the encapsulation does not stick to that mold, so they use a mold release agent, typically some sort of a silicone, uh, and that can actually uh, encroach into the bonding area of the part um, and and wreak havoc with uh, with with adhesion uh, when that happens. Um, so that would be one way that we would see, uh, say, a silicone oil introduced onto the bond a bonding area. Um, silicone oil can also result from uh, vacuum tubes. I had mentioned, uh, you know, it, it, during the lamination process. Um, uh, they, they use silicone oils to make sure that those those uh, rubber uh, tubes do not don't stick to the to the part, and those can um, and, and silicone oil used in that um, that process can actually encroach into the bonding bonding area as well. And uh, anytime we've got silicone oil uh, in the bonding in the bonding area of a part, um, we're, chances are we're probably not going to achieve good adhesion to uh, to that to that area. So. Wanted to pull up a couple of pictures here that uh, really kind of illustrate um, two different scenarios. If you look at that picture over, um, you know, over on the left, um, this was an actual part that came into the lab for, for evaluation. And guys were actually receiving parts that looked just like this in the field. And you see these, these white streaks here, you see these white flakes here. Um, you know, obviously, anytime you see something like that, it's a pretty good indicator that there is something wrong with that part, and that uh, this 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 level of contamination is going to need to be removed before we move on to to, to trying to pretreat and install this part. So, you know, sometimes contamination can be very visible, uh, as is in that case on the left. But uh, a lot of times, and probably more often, uh, it's it's really not visible um, with the naked eye, uh, and that's what we're trying to illustrate here with the picture on the right. Um, what you see is that in order to detect the contamination, the, the non-traditional contamination in this in this case, uh, we had to spray the part with glass cleaner. And what you see is that uh, in in the areas where uh, the contamination is present, the glass cleaner will, will actually beat out beat up, and it won't wet out the way that it's supposed to um, on a non uh, on the non-contaminated areas of the part. So anytime you see a difference in surface area when you spray a, a piece of glass, uh, that's pretty good indicator that there's 
for contamination that, that needs to be removed um, you know, be, before uh, moving forward. So we actually have um, a, a process laid out. Um, and this is actually available, um, you know, actually all, all of this information starting from um, this last section, um, all of this information is available in our technician training manual, uh, which is available up on our website. So if you've never uh, read through that, highly recommend um, going through that. Uh, like I said, all this information is, is available in there as well. But um, just to go through it here, um, our process for detecting and removing contamination, um, we always start with a, with a, a spray of glass cleaner around the, around the perimeter. And like I said, we're looking for areas of contamination. We're looking for areas where that glass cleaner beads up, where there's a clear difference in the surface area and the behavior of the of of the of the glass cleaner, and uh, if we do see uh, evidence of that, well, that's a that's a that's an indication that um, that there is non-traditional contamination that that's going to need to be removed. So um, we move on to step two. When we do see uh, contamination, we, we're going to leave that glass cleaner on the part, and we're going to do a wet scrub with our Sika Power Clean Aid pads. Uh, these things are, are fantastic for removing uh, all, all kinds of different contaminants. Um, a lot of guys like um, uh, Scotch-Brite really don't have a problem with Scotch-Brite. Um, I found in the lab that it, it does a, a really good job at contamination removal as well, uh, wet scrubbing with a, with a Scotch-Brite. Um, the only thing, the only negative, if I had to pick one for Scotch-Brite, is that uh, if you get a little uh, if you get a little careless or a little over aggressive, and um, you know, and you end up scratching the visible area of the of the of the glass part, well, it's going to be very noticeable, um, you know, by the customer or you know anybody who who's looking uh, at that part. Uh, that's what's nice about the Power Clean Aid sponges; they do um, an equal job in terms of contamination removal. And even if you were to get into the um, the visible area. Uh, of the piece of glass, you're not going to create a visible scratch. Um, it's it's doing a, all of its abrasion at the at the microscopic level, and um, in, in anything that were to encroach into the the, uh, the the clear area of the glass wouldn't would not be visible. So uh, that's why we like uh, those power clean aid sponges just a little bit more. So um, using a circular motion or a back and forth motion, you'd want to make sure you um, you know cover the entire bonding area of, of the piece of glass. Um, Use decent pressure. You don't want to use too much because uh, if you use too much pressure, especially on a rough frit, you might start to that 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 pad that sponge might start to uh, to fall apart a little bit. But decent pressure to make sure we're getting uh, you know a, a good abrasion and making sure that we're removing those those contaminants. Uh, so once we make our way all the way across um, the glass part, wipe the remaining glass cleaner with a paper towel, and then what we want to make sure we do is spray the part again to ensure that the contamination has been removed. And what we should see is a nice even wet out of the glass cleaner. Um, if, we, uh, if we don't see that and we're still seeing uh, beating up of the glass cleaner, well, the recommendation there would be actually to uh, uh, wipe, off the glass wipe off that second glass cleaner application and actually do a dry scrub around the perimeter of the part. Um, you know, what we found over you know, our course of testing is that the wet scrub is, is, is very effective. Um, you know, for removing uh, just about anything that you might come across, but should anything remain a dry, a dry scrub is actually a little bit more effective. So, uh, if you encounter a piece of glass that uh, uh, doesn't come doesn't come clean with one wet scrub, well, then we would want to move on to a dry scrub, uh, just because it does tend to be a little bit more uh, a little bit more effective in, in contaminant removal. So, um, we're going to continue steps four and five. Um, scrubbing and checking to make sure that uh, the contamination has been removed uh, and, until we have it all gone. Um, it, it, there, I've come across parts in the lab where it has taken more than one, um, more than one or two scrubs with the uh, Power Clean Aid sponge uh, to remove all the contamination because they, they do sometimes come in so heavily contaminated. So it's not uh, unheard of. It, it is definitely uncommon, but it's not unheard of. Uh, for a piece of glass to to require a, a couple of a uh, couple of passes with a sponge in order to have everything uh, removed. If after several attempts you just can't seem to get rid of the contamination, uh, we would not recommend installing that part in that instance. Um, it, it's just um, it's so much more likely to come back as a leaker um, if we're trying to bond over uh, over contamination. So once we uh, but once we do have all the contamination removed 
and we're we've confirmed that with the uh, spring with glass cleaner and we see good wet out um, across the bonding area well then we're free to go ahead and um, apply our pretreatment product or if you're using a primerless to glass product uh, go ahead and um, you know up, apply the um, the adhesive so that's uh, that's it for contamination uh, detection and removal um, Moving on now, wanted to talk a little bit about our pretreatment products. Uh, here at Sika, we do have two. We've got a clear product uh, called Sika Activator Pro. Um, it's available in, uh, uh, I think those are uh, 300 milliliter cans, as well as um, the single use applicator pads. Uh, either one works very, very well for, uh, you know, for, for pretreating a, uh, a piece of glass. Um, some of the some of the product properties here, just in bullet point form, I'll go through them real quick. Uh, we can use it across the entire temperature range that we use our, 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 our adhesive, so all the way from zero to 120 degrees. Um, above 15, it's only a three minute flash time. Um, and below 15 degrees, it's a 10 minute flash off time to make sure that uh, the product's reacting uh, completely. Because it's not just it's not just the solvent releasing into the flashing and releasing into the atmosphere. There's actually a chemical reaction that's taking place. Um, where the adhesion promoters that we include in in the uh, in the product are actually um, reacting to, with and bonding to um, that that piece of glass. Uh, the maximum open time for uh, Seek Activator Pro is eight hours. If you exceed uh, eight hours, uh, that's okay, not a big deal. You can reapply the product up to three additional times. So this product can actually be um, applied four total uh, a total of four times. Uh, should you should you exceed that eight hour open time, uh, it is very quick and clean. Being a clear product, it's a single wipe process. Uh, you wipe on only. There's no need for a wipe off step. Uh, as I said, it's available in uh, in cans or pads. Uh, it does not need to be shaken in in either form. Uh, the product is is well mixed um, as it is, so uh, does not need to be shaken. And uh, importantly, um, touch um, a, a, a surface, a bonding area, a bonding surface. Um, that that's been pretreated. So um, even with a gloved finger, or especially with a, a bare finger, um, we want to make sure that um, nothing is coming in contact with that uh, bonding surface once the pretreatment product has been applied. Our our other pretreatment product is our Sika Primer 207 AGR. It's our all-in-one black primer. So um, this product actually gets used for touching up pinch weld scratches. Um, as well as uh, can be used for 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 pretreating glass parts as well. Uh, again, just like with the Activator Pro, it can be used uh, across our entire uh, temperature range that our adhesives can be used in. Uh, so zero to 120 degrees. And with the 207, uh, there really is no need to uh, give it longer at the low temperatures. Uh, so even below 15 degrees, all the way down to zero, uh, the three minute flash off time is, is sufficient. Uh, just like with the Activator Pro, it has a maximum a maximum time of eight hours, and uh, were you to exceed that eight hour mark uh, after applying Seek uh, Seek Primer 207 AGR, it can be reapplied one additional time. So a uh, total of two applications are acceptable for the uh, 207 primer. Uh, you apply it with uh, either a dauber, or it can actually be applied um, very nicely with our Seek Power Clean Aid sponge. Um, oh, we got a little. Miss that typo there. It says power cure. That should say power clean aid sponge. My apologies for that. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the power clean aid sponge does a really nice job of uh, of, of applying the uh, primer in a very nice straight line, uh, really nice edges, a uh, real clean application of uh, of primer using the, the power clean aid sponge. Um, for uh, for cans, which you know, since this is really about uh, glass pretreatment. Um, we're 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 always going to be using um, primer out of the can, not out of the, the 207 AGR sticks. Uh, same product, it goes into both uh, packaging types, but you know, due to the small 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 volume, um, I think there are 1. Uh, 1.3 mLs. I think are in the sticks, um, 1.4 mLs um, in the in the sticks. You really just wouldn't get very far um, trying to um, apply primer to a piece of glass using one of those uh, applicator sticks. So uh, keep those for pinch weld touch-ups, um, but they're really not ideal for applying primer to, uh, to glass. Uh, so when using product out of, a, you know, out of the can, it is a, you wanna shake it until you hear the mixing balls starting to rattle, and then actually you shake it for uh, 10 additional seconds after that. And just like with the, uh, with the Activator Pro, we, never wanna, we wanna make sure we never touch it after application. 
um, you know, really with anything, um, we, we want to make sure nothing comes in contact with the, um, you know, with the, with the, with the primer uh, after application until that, especially until that uh, three minute flash off has occurred. Then if you need to attach moldings or something along those lines, um, you know, feel free to, to do so at that point. But uh, you know, really want to make sure we're giving it the, the, the full three minute flash uh, before we, before anything comes in contact with it. So those are our uh, pretreatment products. Um, the last section here uh, is really dedicated to um, our SICA's re recommendation for special sets and special circumstances. So uh, each slide represents uh, one of our special sets that we've identified. So we'll go through those uh, one by one here and just kind of talk through them real quick. Most of the information is on the slide. You can see, uh, you know, read for yourself. But uh, we'll talk through them and just uh, and just make sure that everything's. Uh, everything's clear. So, first one on the list here are uh, parts with an inner layer frit. You know, I'd mentioned during the uh, glass manufacturing process that uh, tin side of flow glass tends to be a, a rather difficult surface to to bond to um, consistently, and uh, because of this, you know, we found that uh, our Secret Primer 207 AGR is just a little bit more robust of a product when it comes to bonding to these um, to these parts with the inner layer frit. The uh, Seek Activator Pro does a really nice job, provided you can, um, um, can remove all the contamination. Um, but what we found is that removing all the contamination on these parts is just really, really difficult. Um, to, so to, to really make things easier, um, the, the best bet whenever you encounter a part with an inner layer frit, where we're actually bonding to, that, uh, to, to the glass and not to the frit itself, uh, just go ahead and use the, uh, the, the Seek Primer 207 AGR. Um, moving on to the next one, um, removal and replacement, or uh, removal and uh, remove and inst uh, install, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, typically, you know, with these, it's it's not a problem at all. Um, we're removing the glass. We want to try and stay um, in the middle of that uh, that installed bead, uh, just to give ourselves a little bit of uh, beef there that we can later come back and and trim down uh, when it's time to install. Uh, so we cut the piece of glass out. Um, clean it with a glass cleaner, uh, and then we would uh, move forward into the uh, the trimming process, to trim it down to um, uh, typically it's a millimeter or so, uh, maybe a little bit less, um, uh, and as as well as on the uh, the pinch weld, and then we could uh, you know reinstall. And you know since we're going urethane to urethane, fresh urethane to to old urethane, we know that that gives us a pretty good bond. So um, you know there's really not any. Uh, pretreatment typically re required um, when we're bonding urethane to urethane. But, uh, you know, just one important thing to note, uh, this recommendation only holds if that existing urethane, that existing layer of urethane has good adhesion around the entire perimeter of the glass part. Uh, it really doesn't matter which adhesive company, um, you know, which which adhesive was used um, for that, that, um, that, it, that previously installed bead. Uh, as long as it is urethane and as long as it is well adhered around the part, then we can uh, trim it down and, and just uh, and, and use that as our bonding surface. If, if for some reason that existing urethane does not have good adhesion, we would definitely not recommend uh, reinstalling that part. So in a similar vein as R&R, um, uh, want to include one on, on used glass, um, you know, in the inter the the uh, procedure that Seek endorses here, uh, really, we're going to follow exactly the interpretation provided by Agris, where um, the recycled or used glass really has to meet uh, two conditions. The glass has to be in a condition that will permit a safe installation, uh, must be free of obvious structural or visually objectionable flaws, uh, including delamination, edge chips, cracks, breaks, uh, distortion in acute vision area, et cetera. Um, and the glass has to be installed with a, a compatible uh, retention system, a uh, system that's compatible with the OE design. And then obviously the same would hold, you know, as we mentioned with, um, you know, with with R and R, um, the 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 existing urethane does have to be well adhered um, to, or, you know, around the entire perimeter of the part, or we would not recommend using it. So, um, moving on, um, the next slide here is on gasket sets, um, utilizing. Polyurethane on a gasket set windshield. Um, we would want to see all the areas of glass that will sit in the gasket. We want to see them prepared with either uh, Activator Pro or 207. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, 
We also apply Activator Pro or, or Primer 207 AGR to the to the pinch weld where the gasket will sit. And uh, if desired, um, it's definitely not uh, it's definitely not required. Uh, but if desired, to the inside uh, channels of the gasket. If you are applying a pretreatment product to the in inside channels of the gasket, uh, we want to give it a little bit more time, just because um, typically those are pinched off a little bit and um, and a little bit porous, and we want to make sure all that solvent has a chance to flash off, um, you know, before we before we move forward. So um, we would then set the windshield, making sure that the gasket is fully seated on the pinch weld. Um, be sure to apply the desired Seek AGR adhesive into the channels of the gasket at the appropriate time and clean, clean it up using mineral spirits or, uh, or, or scrubs. Um, you know, the one exception, or at least one of the, the main exceptions to, um, to that would be the, uh, the Freightliner Cascadias where that, um, you know, that, that uh, gasket is getting bonded to, to, the, to the, uh, pinch, the, uh, the vehicle flange. Um, for that, we've got a very specific set of recommendations that um, has been approved by Freightliner. Um, for those, uh, for pretreatment of the gasket material, uh, we want to use a very special product uh, called Seca Activator 100. It is uh, a different product from Seca Activator Pro. Uh, we have tested Seca Activator Pro in this application. It's, it does not give as good of a bite into the, uh, the Freightliner gaskets, the Cascadia gaskets, as the Activator 100. So we always want to make sure we are using that Seca Activator 100. And then the product approved by Freightliner, um, you know, for use on this application would be our hot applied Seca Tech ASAP Plus. Um, you know, not using this system, um, you could potentially void the Freightliner warranty. So that's why, um, that's why we've got these products, um, you know, specifically for this one application. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Seek Activator Pro and uh, Seek Primer 207 AGR really just can't be used as a substitute for Activator 100 in, in this application. Uh, moving along, um, pause applications. Um, I, I don't know that these are necessarily all that common these days. Uh, they're not nearly as common as they were maybe 10, 20 years ago. Uh, but should you encounter them, um, see, feel free to apply uh, Seek Activator Pro. Give it a little bit extra flash off time since it is a, a more porous substrate. Uh, so 10 minutes on that, and then um, you're you're good to you're you're good to apply, uh, uh, and, and you'll achieve excellent adhesion to those uh, those pause parts. Uh, rear sliders. Uh, this is a very very important one. Uh, so I want to go through this a little bit more closely. Um, so encapsulated parts or painted or painted rear, rear sliders. Um, you know the uh, the the procedure is the same on both of those. Uh, we always want to start with an abrasion step. Uh, and typically, especially if it's a painted part, um, you know, a scotch right pad uh, works very, very well. Um, wouldn't necessarily want to use a power clean aid for, for this because uh, we, we do want a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit deeper uh, abrasion, which the scotch right provides, um, you know, for these parts. Um, but start with an abrasion step. Um, and, you know, really, I do want to point out that sometimes, especially, um, especially on encapsulated parts, um, you know, some of those are, are made from a very, very soft PVC rubber material. Um, and that soft, soft PVC material is just extremely difficult to get a good bond to. So, you know, when, when we come across these parts, really the best thing that we can do is really go heavy on the abrasion step. Uh, that's where, you know, it, it's going to make all the difference in the world. So, you know, when we come across these encapsulated rear, sli rear sliders, um, I would really recommend, you know, hitting it with a, a rubber, a, a wire wheel attached to a, a drill um, to really get a good deep abrasion into that encapsulation. Uh, and that's just going to give us better, you know, better bite in when we then go through uh, the, the rest of the process. So if it's a painted part, you know, scotch Bright works great. But uh, if it's an encapsulated part, it's, you know, and especially if it feels soft, um, really the more aggressive you can go with the abrasion step, the better off you're going to be and the, the more likely you are to have success with the, with the installation. So once we do the, the abrasion step, um, the next step would be to remove the dust and debris. And really anything you want to do there is, is, is really fine. Uh, if you want to do use Activator Pro, that's fine. Uh, mineral spirits works very well. Um, or even, um, you know, a, a wet um, piece of paper, uh, piece of lint-free paper towel uh, works, works really well. As long as we, you know, remove all the dirt and debris and we allow it to completely dry. Um, you know, really whatever you want to do there is is not problematic. 
because you know what's doing the heavy lifting here is going to be the primer, which uh, we see in step three. Applying the Seeker Primer 207 AGR using a brush or dauber, uh, probably wouldn't recommend. Um, again, here using a power clean aid sponge. Um, really want want to stick with a brush or dauber for for application onto these, uh, you know, onto these these um, encap especially the encapsulated parts, uh, the rear sliders. Um, give it three minutes to dry, and then uh, go ahead and set the set the part. But uh, really, you know, uh, again, just to just to reiterate, uh, the abrasion step is really critical, uh, you know, for these. And anybody that's ever had issues with it um, can't re recommend strongly enough, you know, really go aggressive with that abrasion step. And um, you know, I, I tip we've seen the problems for a lot of customers go away when they when they move to a you know a more aggressive abrasion step, especially on those encapsulated parts. Uh, so the last one on my list here is organic glass, so polycarbonate and acrylic. So think heavy truck and other, um, you know, agricultural equipment, things like that. Um, we definitely have a, a procedure for that as well. Um, uh, start with an abrasion step. Um, I would we, here we want to recommend uh, sandpaper, uh, you know, medium grit, uh, 80 grit, 120 grit, somewhere in that range. Um, and really, what we want to pay attention to is that a lot of times polycarbonate comes. With um, with a hard coat or you know a, a margard coating on it, uh, we always want to make sure that we're sanding through that uh, you know any coating that may exist on the surface of that plastic part. We want to make sure we sand through that uh, to get to the uh, you know to to the to the material underneath. Once that um, you know once once you've abraded it, um, dry wipe works better than anything. Um, you know we we've looked at it and Activator Pro works. 99.9 percent .9 of the time but uh there were a couple of parts that we looked at where it, it did uh it did actually prove to be detrimental to achieving a durable bond so you know really all you need is a, a dry wipe to remove the dirt and debris um, and on the polycarbonate and acrylic parts uh, apply 207 agr uh, give it three minutes and then you, you're you're all set to uh, install the part with um, any of our adhesives so that's really uh, all that I had. Um, I had mentioned it before, but uh, I'll say it again. Um, all of this information is available in our technician, the uh, AGR technician training manual, which is available on our website. Uh, a really um, invaluable resource for you know for anybody that's doing glass installation. Um, you know, with all of our recommended uh, procedures for 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 any situation you may encounter. Um, and if anything that you may encounter is is not in there, well, we've got um, we've got sales our sales staff um, scattered you know throughout the country uh, available at a mo moment's notice for a phone call or for a training or for whatever the case may be. So uh, definitely recommend uh, checking out our website uh, SikaIndustry.com. Uh, you know you can find find the TTM, find the training manual, um, use the the links to find your local sales representative um, and uh, all the other valuable. Uh, resources that are up on the website, uh, you know, product data sheets, safety data sheets, and, and everything else. So that is all that I had for you for today. So um, we'll wrap things up here, and um, I guess we'll turn it over and uh, see if there were any questions that uh, that, that came in, um, you know, uh, throughout the course of the uh, presentation here. Mike, very nice job. Uh, Ron Combs here. I want to thank you for taking the class or the audience through uh, this afternoon's learning uh, learning event. Uh, we did field a series of questions throughout the course of uh, the seminar, and uh, I wanted to save a few of them just to expand the uh, discussion to a wider audience. Start with, uh, you know, let's see, the first one here reads, uh, if I'm concerned about the cleanliness of a urethane when doing an RNR, so a removal and replacement, what extra cleaning measures can I take? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good point. Um, you know, Obviously, the goal is to, you know, when you're cutting out, uh, doing an R&R &R to cut through the middle of that bead. Sometimes it's not possible. Uh, sometimes you get a little close to the glass, and that's fine. You know, once, uh, you know, once you've you've cleaned it and you've you've you know you've trimmed the remaining area, um, you know, really you can just um, with Seek Activator Pro. Um, you know, it, it does it does an excellent job of cleaning, uh, and and actually is depositing some you know adhesion promoters down on the surface as well. So. Um, that that would be my recommendation for for, for you know if, if you need an extra extra cleaning step uh, you know on an already thin uh, section of 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 urethane um, you know would be to use the Activator Pro. Fantastic, great. Um, let's see our second. Uh, why are Sika Primer 207 sticks 
not uh, not proposed or used on glass. Yeah, it's really it should really just the amount of volume in there. You know, the uh, the the volume is just so small. It's um, like I think it's one point four milliliters in a in a stick. Typical application on a windshield would be uh, probably about five to ten milliliters of of primer. So it, it, you'd be using a lot of sticks if you if you tried to apply um, you know a, try to apply to a piece of glass you know using using the sticks. So it's really just a matter of of um, you know the, the amount of material that's available in those sticks. Got it. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, uh, glass cleaner. Uh, question ask. Uh, question ask. Are there any advantages to using an aerosol cleaner versus a liquid volume or liquid base glass cleaner? No, there's not really. You know, from from our perspective, there's not really much of a difference. Um, you know, I would say that uh, you know one of the most important functions of glass cleaner these days is contamination. Uh, detection, um, you know, with the with the aerosols, you know that that product goes down white typically, and so you get that you get a nice contrast. Uh, you know, when the white, you know, when it beads up, um, uh, you you see you see the black of the frit coming through versus when it wets out nicely, it's it's nice white uniform white. Um, so there's some benefit there, but uh, yeah, the liquid ones um, might even be, you know, I I think they're 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 typically. Um, they're 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 even better at um, at beating up when they're supposed to, if if you if you will. Um, you know, the, sometimes that uh, you know, if you get a little sputter in your aerosol, um, you can actually get a little area where the the, the glass cleaner doesn't actually hit um, on the surface, and it may look like it's it's beat it up, where really it was just sputtering and spitting a little bit, and you just didn't get you just didn't get the glass cleaner down on that uh, that surface, versus the liquid where. Um, you know, you actually you can you can ensure that uh, it's been applied over you know the the entire area, and you can see that um, you know that beating up. So you know, I, I would say that there's pluses and minuses to both. Um, but for from Sega's perspective, you know, whatever you're most comfortable with, or you know, whoever's giving you the best price, uh, as long as it doesn't contain uh, anti-static ingredient, uh, you know, we're we're really pretty comfortable. You know, the, the, all the different glass cleaners, aerosol and liquid that are in the market. Fantastic, Mike. And then just uh, I think the last uh, question kind of applies to Activator Pro versus 100. The first question is Activator 100 for freight liners. Is this sourced through both your aftermarket folk or your transportation folk? How would you instruct a customer to get a hold of uh, 100 specifically? Yeah, un unfortunately, we don't, um, you know, this product is not easily obtainable through our standard distribution channels. So really, absolute best thing you can do is reach out to your um, lo your local sales rep um, and and they can definitely um, you know work with you to get that product in your hands. Um, it's really the best way to to, to handle getting um, getting the Activator 100 because it really is critical to use that product for those Cascadias. Um, so definitely reach out to your your local local sales rep and um, and and they'll and they'll do whatever it takes to make sure that you've got that product. Great. And then the last thing on the Activator product, Mike, uh, Activator Pro and or 100. Um, can you apply those products with a dauber, or what's best to use when uh, when when applying those two materials? No, I you know I um, you know there have been in the industry clear products that have been applied with a dauber. Um, our activator products really aren't designed to be applied with a dauber. Um, you know the, the problem that we run into is that uh, the activators are actually our activators are are designed to be used uh, in a very 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 thin layer. Uh, we would say, uh, you know, a, a single molecule works best, right? And uh, the problem with dauber applications that actually, actually puts down way, way, way too much material. Um, so uh, when when applying, you know, we we obviously want to use a, um, you know, the, the pads work wonderfully. Or a uh, if you're applying from a bottle, you want to use a, a a paper towel, wet the paper towel, and then and then um, dauber application just would wouldn't be ideal, just because uh, it, it would apply it too thick. Fantastic. I, I think that covers it all, Mike. Again, thank you for the time putting this uh, presentation together and for the educational opportunity this afternoon. Josh? Thank you, everyone. Thanks sir, to everyone for attending. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Mike and Ron. Uh, so that concludes the Q&A portion of today's webinar. If you have further questions or need additional information, please contact your local SICA sales representative or visit us online at www.sicaindustry.com. Uh, you can also reach our customer service department at one 800 688-7452. And for technical questions, um, please email the technical service department at tsmh 
at us.sika.com. As we conclude the webinar, a brief survey will come up on your screen. If you could please take a couple minutes to fill it out, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of their schedules to attend today's session, and a special thanks to Mike Ray for leading this webinar and sharing his expertise on Sika's processes and procedures for glass preparation in the automotive aftermarket. Um, so thank you all again, and have a great day, everyone.